My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCahn.com. Welcome back to another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. My name is Jeffrey Can, and I'm joined today by a friend of mine, Brett Chell, who is CEO and founder, Brett, of Cold Board Technologies. Is, uh, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Jeffrey. Appreciate it. Um, so uh, I, I'm the, the reason for uh, taking an interest in in your um, the area of, of of the industry that you focused on, uh, Brett, was uh, actually goes back to a meeting that we had some months ago where you had explained to me uh, your interest in automating more of rig activities in the field, and uh, and I know you've advanced uh, uh, the world along in that direction, which is good. But uh, so mm-hmm. I, today I want to get into that, learn a little bit more about what what you're up to in that in that regard. But let's let's wind back a little bit and get get some of your background. Like where what, what's your story? Where, where did you uh, you know your career start out, and how did you get into the role that you're in today? Sure, uh, no problem. So yeah, um, I guess coming on almost twenty years now, which is something I don't readily like to admit but uh <laughs> you, you most, look pretty you look it, pretty young dude i gotta tell you <laughs> yeah. good skin cream good skin cream <laughs> so uh yeah i know so like 20 years experience in oil and gas um uh, the first six or seven of it was spent in the field on drilling rigs mm. uh mostly coil rigs coil top drive hybrids and then uh, you know technic oil and then went uh with a company called extreme so i was a second employee at extreme um where we you know i worked with uh a really good group of guys uh, to build and develop the really the first generation of coil top drive hybrids that mm-hmm. we're kind of going to take over drilling um, in the early 2000s before the long extended reach horizontals yep. came into play. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I was working on those developing technology. Um, from there, I kind of left the, the drilling field per se for four or five years. Um, came into downtown Calgary and worked with a few guys um, that mentored me in private equity, venture capital, and institutional financing mechanisms and procedures. And really, that was just so I could get a base understanding of how the finance uh, you know, portion of this business worked, mm-hmm. uh, knowing full well that I was going to go into you know, developing my own uh, companies in the future. So I just wanted to understand how to bootstrap finance and do step financing to get the startups through you know, the earlier stages until you get a little bit of stability. Yeah. And so I spent yeah, yeah for a, four or five years doing that. That is a real flat spot, actually, for a lot of entrepreneurs, which is uh, they, they don't understand the capital side, how to raise money, how to pitch, uh, you know, sources of funds, what, what investors are looking for. So I mean, useful to get that under your belt. You know, looking back, it's as important, if not more important, than the actual experience in the industry itself. Mm. Uh, and I really do appreciate some of my mentors telling me that early on. They're like, because I had all these aspirations that I wanted to go start my own company and, and do my own thing. And they said, look, it's great that you have the, the ambition. It's great you have some experience, but you need to understand finance because if you don't understand the mechanisms of financing your business, you're going to end up not owning it at some point. <laughs> That's um, very true. The VCs are pretty quick yeah. to say, uh, yeah, we'll lend you the money, but you got to surrender 75% or voting or shares or what have you to, to secure the funding. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's either if you, even if you get into a spot where it's a little more difficult, hmm. you just don't have the acumen or the wherewithal to understand how to stick and move and, uh, you know, find some type of, creative financing mechanism to make whatever you need to happen happen but even you know as far down as when things are going well and you're at the table you know you you know what financing you're looking for it's the ability to speak with understanding you know it doesn't matter if you're sitting with a private equity guy or a vc or an institutional guy if he knows that you know all the different potential pathways then you take that lever away from them when they're trying to pull that to figure out how to get more or control more of the company. Yeah, so yeah, that's a fair it, point. It's really actually. invaluable. Yeah, either either you have to have someone on your side, or or as you say, uh, get onto the other side of the table so that you can see the the, the dimensionality. Let's turn to the the yeah, problem sure. though that you're trying to solve. Like like so so twenty years in the field. Now you've got a finance background, and um, so what? What is it that you uh, t- t- describe a bit more about the problem in the field that you're trying to solve? Sure. 
Yeah, so I'll call it a street level finance. <laughs> I don't want to do a disservice to any real finance guys that put the time in at Harvard. Hey, so, I've, um, I've I've got an MBA in finance and corporate finance, so you know you're not dissing me any. I I uh, it's not it's not my profession. <laughs> so there you go, exactly. So you're the guy I'm talking about. Pretty so much. I'll yep. call it a street a street level degree of finance. Yep. yep. So um, uh, yeah. So I mean, give, given that I came from the drilling industry, um, I was very familiar with drilling rigs and uh, all the different digital systems that were on them. Mm. And so when we were working out there, we would always have a pace on or uh, an NLV rig sense yep. system on the rig. And it was just kind of like, you know, we just, just, we didn't even think anything of it. Uh, of course, they have a computer, uh, you know, a centralized operating system. And of course, it's gathering all the sensor data and showing the driller what he needs to see and putting the rest in a database. Mm-hmm. That was just, that's table stakes. Um, so uh, when I started Cold Bore, we were actually developing downhole drilling tools. Um, and we were, you know, for lack of a better word, forced to pivot in the downturn uh, uh, because nobody cared about drilling tools. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now we're squarely in completions. Um, and the path to getting there came from a, a pretty big on-site aha realization that came from the experience of running those electronic drilling recorders. So we made the pivot over to completions and we had a tool that was recording a ton of data, quarter terabyte a day. And I was having the conversation with some guys on a shell location saying, you know, what we're doing in real time is important. Um, it's great, but I've got a quarter terabyte a day of data that you need to, um, you know, you need to have access to and you need to correlate and be able to analyze so you can do a deeper dive into your operation and figure out what's going on. So where do I send it? Where's your, and I could only think of my drilling experience. I said, where's your EDR mm. for completion? Like your, your pace on or your rig sense. Yep. And I really just got a, it really stumped almost everybody I talked to for the, for a long time. Well, this is, and, a, and their this, answer was, yeah, this is classic, right? I'm collecting yeah. this massive amount of information and it doesn't get used. It doesn't go anywhere. And that's it. Yeah. Right. And so mm-hmm. their, their answer was always, uh, well, go talk to the frack track. Um, or we don't have it. There is no centralized operating system for fracking. Hmm. And I just thought, wow, that's a big hole in the market because it, go talk to the frack fan. No, that's only one service of, that's a service of one of five. Yeah. Like that's not, that's not a centralized system tracking the operation. That's one service telling you what their perception of the operation is. But I thought, I thought it's, uh, is it not true that, that frack companies will backhaul um, frack data uh, to central places so that some, some centralized frack experts can be monitoring frack jobs in real time? Is that not happening? Sometimes, yeah. It's a lot more rare than I actually initially thought. Uh, huh. You would think that, so when I went out there, I was like, I just assumed there would be a completions operating system. Like uh-huh. an all-encompassing one, uh-huh. meaning a centralized operating system where all the services connected got on and started communicating and shared data, and the operator had access to it, so they could run analytics and you know make decisions on the fly and change their op- their operation on the fly. Yeah, none of that really existed. So what you're saying is the remote access to raw frac data mm. um, that does exist in places, mm. but it's pretty rudimentary, huh. right? Um, so there, there are companies coming into the space in the last three or four years, as we have, that are SaaS, they're a SaaS perspective, and that's what they do. They, they have, they're kind of fixing that problem. So, right? so SaaS, um, SaaS meaning software as a service, is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yep. Yeah. So they're coming in and saying, we're going to grab your frac data and we're going to visualize it a lot better. We're going to use some ML. We're going to make it more consumable, um, you know, and we're going to give you remote access to it. Mm. And so that was a great, that is a great first step. Um, and most of the market went that way just because uh, implementing SaaS is, you know, it's a challenge, but it's a manageable challenge. Mm. It is fa- um, it's faster and easier than, than the alternative. So, and, you know, the world is moving quickly into that, that structural model. So it makes sense. Mm. Yeah, 100%. Mm. So the challenge here is that the, the data now what the industry wasn't aware of uh, wasn't readily aware of until recently is that the data that is being collected is being collected in a very manual fashion so there's a few problems here it's a really manual int- manually intensive process for all the individual services mm-hmm. um, there's no standard format like on drilling so mm-hmm. drilling has WITSML completions there's no standard format 
Mm-hmm. Um, and third, there's uh, five services on location, not one. So yeah. the operator is looking at a drilling operation and they say, yeah, I just got to hold the drilling company accountable. Whereas on a zipper frack, you got four or five services tripping over each other, causing problems. And there's five different timestamps on five different sets of data that are all a different format. Yeah. That is raw data that they're trying to correlate to their operational uh, time series data. Mm. Right. So you have raw data. You want to correlate it to your recorded time series data so you can see cause and effect. Mm. Right. But the problem is their time series data is their company man recording it in a notebook, putting it in Excel and then emailing it to the office. Yeah. Yeah. So totally. So you, you're, 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 yeah, st- you're sitting in a digital world trying to figure this out. Time delays, um, can't, can't not operating in real time, can't dynamically allocate or change direction. It's just uh, not not a not a great place to be. And yet the right, industry exactly. still is successful in making making money. Well, su- success, success. Well, that's that's a subjective comment right? because <laughs> we're seeing a lot of acquisitions and a lot of people getting bought up. That's right? true. I'm sure, they would rather keep operating. Yeah, that's um, true. So, you know, where, where we come in, the smart pad is we took a little, little bit different approach. So when we were talking about those SaaS companies, mm. they're great because they make better visualizations of the frac data and all that, but they're, they don't do anything to solve, to improve the quality of data. So they, right? just, take, they just, just take the raw data in and give it get. to you. Yeah. They take it in, they give it to you, whatever it is. Um, if it's, there's anomalies in it, everything is what it's as, as picked up from the field. Yeah. Right. And so the trouble for the operator is you could have a 15% variance with this great visualization. You don't know if that's a variance in your operation or if it's a variance in data acquisition. Mm. Yep. How it was collected. Yeah. Right. Yep. And so that makes it really hard to get tight on your margins and incre- increase efficiencies and all that stuff. So yeah. the real problem, which is where we're focused, is in improving the data quality and the data acquisition, cleaning it all up on prem mm. with an edge server. Mm. And then sending one clean stream out of a structured, normalized database. And is that across all so, of the multiple services that might be, say, on a on a zipper frag job? Well, exactly. Mm. So this is another point to that. Mm. You can't do that for just one service yeah, because it has to be in the context of the operation. Right. Right. So exactly right. This is a very service centric um, industry uh, completions. They mm. all, you know, frac worries about frac. Wireline worries about wireline, mm. and then they all get their data and they just throw it to the operator, and it's the operator's onus to figure out what to do with it. Yeah, that has to change. Yeah, right. And the big service companies know it. It has to be an operate an operator's perspective, and yeah. the service companies, the first ones that realize, and they are that realize to come to the table with a centralized operating system to make their service data consumable in a contextual format that that encompasses the whole operation, they're going to win. Because the operator is just going to naturally gravitate to them. Yeah, and and I know you've you've had some some uh, some companies pick up this technology and start moving with it. What 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 results have you have you or have they reported or have they revealed to you that that has been a you know been a value to them? Yeah, uh, so we've had well actually you know what so I'll I'll step back to why our solution is a little because that'll lead into this yeah. answer for where yeah, they sure. derive the value. So. Hmm. Um, the key aspect of why SmartPad is different than all the SaaS companies out there is that we digitize the frac trees with hardware. Uh, right? yeah. So no one else, yeah, nobody else wants to get into having a company that has three arms, hardware, software, and service. Mm. Nightmare. But it's a necessary evil for this because drilling start when Payson and NOV came around with their, their EDRs. They just, there were nothing was digitized in the 80s, right? And 90s. And so when they digitized stuff, they came out with a format that everyone adopted. Mm. So everyone on drilling uses width. Mm. But when completions came around 15 or 20 years ago, there was digital all over the place, right? And so everybody adopted their own formats and structures and customs, custom this and custom that. Yeah. So one of the biggest problems is, is that all those formats are, they're uh, unreconcilable at this point. Right. And so the only way to solve that, and we all know that we can't make a new language like a wits to enforce it on everyone, because uh-huh. that just buckle, that, that buckles their business. They're just never going to do it. It's too expensive and disruptive. So what we did is we digitized the frac tree, meaning valve position and pressure sensors, uh-huh. because that digital representation does a whole bunch of things aside from safety and give us visibility and all that secondary stuff. But it feeds an algorithm that allows us to do automated state detection. 
So what that means is oh. when our algorithm sees pressure in this zone and this valve configuration, that's frac. Oh, and it can do that. Do, does that dynamically is in in as the work is being under uh, is being executed? Then that's right. So all the right. software is picking up and recording all your time series data, mm. not your company man, not your company guy, right? right? And the, yeah, now you got far more, m- much nicer fidelity, machine machine generated, highly accurate, and then now you can uh, using timestamps. I presume you can now correlate multi multiple streams of data ba- just based on time alone. Ah. See, yeah, smart guy. You're nailing it. So all those benefits, you go from a medium resolution data set to high, high resolution. resolution yeah. That saves yep. hundreds of thousands right there because when humans record stuff, it was 315 to 330. <laughs> but really, it was 312 to 333. Yeah. And there were seven minutes on that operation at 10,000 bucks an hour that we missed times yeah. 40 a day. Yeah. Yeah, we can't figure so, out what happened. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And so, what's right. been so, what's been so industry's then, reaction? Has they have they? I assume that they've stared at this and said, "There's got a there's value here." So it's just like anything. Mm-hmm. Um, oil and gas is notoriously uh, difficult for technology adoption. Mm-hmm. Really slow, really stuck in their ways. Um, but I believe that is because um, they're just making so much money that it was a land grab all the time, right? Opportunity cost is extremely uh, high for these these guys. Mm-hmm. But right now, it's the opposite. The opportunity cost is not adopting technology. We're, we're getting killed. We got no margin. We need to find a way to create margin. Yeah. We can't find more wells to drill. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Circumstances so, have um, changed dramatically. Well, that's true in, in North America. Part Well, parts of North America. Is that true south of the border as well in the United States? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and in the last year, they've really had a focus on technology. But uh, I'd still say that there was um, – it was – there. it's just that no one had really seen – the concept of combining all the completions data like this before, so they didn't mm. really understand all the value that could be derived from it. Mm. So there's a process, and that process, you know, some get it, some are a little slower, some are a little faster. Mm. In the last three months, it's really accelerated. Mm. Like something else has happened where everyone's going, we need, and they know what it is now, because there's a few companies in here showing that digital completions exist. Mm. They're saying, we need it. Mm. We're just defining what that is. A to Z. Yeah. So clearly, I mean, the, the it's sometimes the the magic of time is what unlocks insight and organizations thinking around the art of the possible. And so um, the the challenges in the marketplace uh, are, are are a great instigator at times. And so maybe this is the the scenario that we're in. You know, the the you know when the, when all else fails, <laughs> try something different. And um, now, right. yeah, yeah. You know, we're at that we're at that point. Well, it's a lot like uh, Warren Buffett's investment philosophy, right? He always says, "Go in when the cranes are down." Mm. So this is it. It's, yeah, it's scorched earth. Uh, now, what what he didn't tell me. And everybody else that are following that philosophy as young uh, or new entrepreneurs seven years ago mm. is that it's a double-edged sword. When the cranes are down, there's no investment. Nobody wants to listen. Yeah, Clients may say they want it. They may even say, oh, my God, we need technology. Yep. And I have zero money to but, pay you but, for but, it. But exactly. And <laughs> that, that's why your finance background kicks in because I, I might have some creative ways oh. to help you out of this. Mm. That's it. Where we and to say that we had to get creative over the last few years would be a, an understatement, yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. How are you dealing with some of the uh, the obstacles and, and objections? I mean, do you uh, because for you? For, I mean, because the industry is a show me industry. You know, you, if you want to convince yep. an, um, someone who has a, a you know the, the engineering profession, deep mathematics, uh, very risk aware, um, very mm-hmm. very sensitive to impacts of, of their activities on the environment and on people and safety, uh, you know, deep, a deep sense of um, uh, respect for the, the rules and regulations and the standards that are being imposed. So that, by, by virtue of that, also creates a kind of resistance and objection to doing things, because if you don't understand it fully, it's hard to, it's hard to embrace it. So how do, you, how do you help them overcome this? Do you do pilot or do you show them results from another site or do you take them to an existing site and say, let me show you how this works? How do you do that? It's kind of individualistic for that. A little mm. bit of everything. Mm. I mean, first of all, there's the last three years of just getting into boardrooms and telling them the same story yeah. over and over yeah. and over. And uh, that doesn't mean that we had a solution, but taking their feedback and adjusting and tweaking and evolving your product, you know, for a few years, 
mm-hmm. until it shows up to the point where it's okay. Now we got it dialed, mm-hmm. and now you you know you become the expert. So at some point, the conversation changes from mostly asking what the problems are to saying here's the consensus of what the problems have been, and here's the solutions that we market tested and whittled down to the top one or two for this particular problem. Mm -hmm. And here's how we can solve it for you. Now, what's your particular isolated case? Because they're all different. Um, So it really is just a long cycle of education. Um, Being reactive to what the market is telling you is an absolute key. And then when you do get into it and you get to that point, they'll start accepting and saying, okay, this, you know, you've got it to a point where we're going to give it a pilot. Mm -hmm. Then you have to do some price concessions and you have to work with them. You have to absorb some of that risk. You know, you have to take some of that out of them. Yeah. Um, you are, you are first on the, you're first into this market. There's always a risk uh, sharing that has to take place. That's very true. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. When you're creating anything and trying to convince, like, if you're selling toasters and you've got a slightly better toaster, that's an easy conversation. Mm. Everybody understands the concept of a toaster, and I want that feature. I'll mm. take it. Mm. When there's no idea what it is you're talking about, like no one's ever heard of an ECR, Mm. that's a whole different, uh, you know, kind of mental process you have to go through and relationship building process that you have to go through for everybody to get comfortable. So yeah. you just learn the concessions that you have to make. Yeah. A lot of ground, a lot of ground has to be uh, prepared before you can make progress there. I can see that. Uh, so, yeah. you know, there's going to be other entrepreneurs who are listening to this podcast today. Uh, what advice would you have for them? Um, sounds like one might be <laughs> go get smart on finance and another is don't give up. But what else might you, uh, what, yeah. what else would you share? Um, yeah, I mean, without, there's all the cliche things that are just, they all ring so true. Like just really pick something that you want to do. Cause if it gets really tough, mm. that's the only way mm. you're going to be able to stick at it for a really long time yep. over and over and over when it's, you know, you got no, no accolades, no money and no one telling you you're doing a great job you got to be able to keep going in enthusiastic. So if you don't really, you know, enjoy what it is or understand what you're doing, Mm. that's going to get defeating really quick. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And another one, like you said, I I couldn't stress it enough. And someone stressed this to me. You could be as experienced as you want, but take the time to go get a finance education from a mentor. And that, that literally means working for 25, 30 grand a year. I was 34,000 bucks a year for four years, but that was my education. Right. (laughs) So, yeah, yeah it will go a long way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the money industry or, or, or partner with someone or a partner. Yeah. Bring bring someone on board who really understands this. Uh, there's there's ways to do that. You know, rent a CFO or um, particularly one that uh, has some background in capital raise is, a, is, a, is an avenue forward. Uh, this has oh, been, you know what? Here's yeah. one, Jeffrey. Sorry. Mm-hmm. This, this one I didn't do when I was first setting up my business. When you're when you're setting out to found a company with your partners, mm-hmm. everybody is in honeymoon phase. And it's all exciting and everyone wants to just go and you don't want to ruffle any feathers. Stop and take the time to lay out a share structure with that founding stock that has handcuffs, golden handcuffs that are attached to milestones over the course of a time frame. So because what happens is everyone wants to start a business and usually within a year or so in one, two, depending on how many partners you have, some of them are going to give up and they're going to say, this isn't for me. Mm. Don't make the mistake of allocating half your stock to that person that has no recourse because you need that stock to attract the next person that you're going to have to bring in. So if they leave on a three year earnout, make sure you get two thirds of that stock back after the first year so that you can attract the next partner that you need and you don't run out of options. That's a really interesting uh, point of view. I haven't heard that, but that's, that's a, I, I have been, as I've been working with a couple of, um, uh, startups, I've, you know, you, that, that rings very true. A lack of thoughtfulness around, the ownership structure, share allocation, um, draw uh, pullbacks, uh, vesting, um, and then of course there's the rhythm of the business to keep the engagement going. You know, lack of that is what creates this problem that you've you've sketched out. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. If anybody wanted to learn more about what it is that you're doing and, and uh, the uh, you know the the, the impact, uh, Brett, who, how how do they how do they track you down? Do you have a what what is your uh, what's your website name, for instance? Yeah, so it's just www.coldboretechnology.com. Um, or you can just email me directly, Brett 
at coldborsales.com. Coldborsales.com. Fantastic. And it, uh, I, uh, thanks very much for taking the uh, time today to share your story. Uh, Brett, this has been really uh, fascinating, and uh, hopefully um, you'll see some great success uh, down the road as the industry embraces new ways of thinking about uh, work completions. Absolutely. That's been fun. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. You bet. That's it for today's episode of Digital Oil & Gas. Uh, Join me again next week uh, for another episode. Bye for now. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil and Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.